Hi and welcome back to the channel. It's been a little while since I've made a boards prep video so this is overdue. Luckily for today's video I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. We will be discussing both the genitourinary and renal disorders that are likely to pop up not only on your boards exam but potentially in practice as well. We of course are going to discuss urinary tract infections both uncomplicated and complicated, pyelonephritis, hematuria, kidney stones, urinary incontinence, and then acute kidney injury. Like I said, this should be a pretty easy discussion, so don't forget to go ahead and support the channel by liking and subscribing, and let's just dive right into GU. All right, so first let's discuss the urinalysis and urine culture. Um, you're definitely, definitely going to be ordering this a lot in your practice, and you are for sure going to see a question on this pop up on your board's exam. So a complete UA or urinalysis consists of three components, a gross evaluation of the urine, a dipstick analysis, and then a microscopic exam. So the dipstick analysis, this is going to measure specific gravity, pH, heme, leukocyte, esterase, and then nitrite, protein, and glucose. So indicators for a urinary tract infection, the, the words that you're gonna to wanna to look out for on your UA are going to be positive nitrites, positive for white blood cells, and then the leukocyte esterase. And I included here for you the sensitivity of each test. So really nitrites is only 50% sensitive, which means that's a true truth or true positive for urinary tract infection, but still we use it for an indicator a lot. Also white blood cells, look at that 95% sensitive. That's really a very valid test there. And then the leukocyte esterase is 60 to 90% sensitive for urinary tract infection. And then for the microscopic exam, those are things that we're looking at like red, red blood cells, white blood cells, epithelial cells, and then CAS. White blood cell CAS, those can indicate pylo, and red blood cell CAS can indicate glomerulonephritis. And then of course there's the urine culture and sensitivity test, and that should be obtained especially in those pac patients where it is not their first urinary tract infection. And then here it shows you the results of what a positive urine culture is. So greater than the 100,000 of one organism. If multiple different bacteria are present on a specimen, then it's indicated that this is most likely a contaminated sample. Okay, so first up, what are symptoms of a urinary tract infection? That's going to be urgency, frequency, dysuria, lower abdominal and pelvic pain, cloudy urine. We're going to see white blood cells and bacteria present in the urine. If the patient has a complicated urinary tract infection, then we're also going to be seeing systemic symptoms like fever and tachycardia. What makes a urinary tract infection complicated versus uncomplicated? So complicated urinary tract infections include UTIs in males, patients with poorly controlled diabetes, pregnant women, children, elderly, those patients that are immunocompromised, patients with recurrent urinary tract infections, patients that also have kidney stones or kidney obstruction, and then patients with an indwelling catheter. All of those patients are gonna be classified as having complicated urinary tract infections. And then there's also some important risk factors to know for urinary tract infections occurring within women, and that's going to be poor hygiene, and what I mean by that is wiping not front to back, and because that, that kind of leads into the other point here that 75 to 90 percent of UTIs are due to E. coli. And that's why they're also so much more prevalent in women because our anatomy is different. We have shorter urethra and it's easier for the E. coli to infect the area. Also frequent sexual intercourse, pregnancy, use of spermicide, patients that are immunocompromised and poorly controlled diabetics. All of those, again, are gonna be risk factors for having urinary tract infections in women. And then when we diagnose a UTI, of course, that's going to be do a UA in the office, but ultimately the urine culture and sensitivity is going to be the gold standard for diagnosing a urinary tract infection. All right, so on this slide, we're going to be discussing urinary tract infection treatment options. So I have everything listed for you here, both pediatric, uncomplicated, complicated, and pregnant. So we'll just start with pediatric. So it's divided into two populations, less than 24 months and greater than 24 months. If the patient is less than 24 months, then we wanna treat them for a longer duration of time, seven to 14 days. If the patient is older than 24 months and it's their first urinary tract infection, then it's appropriate to treat them for five days. 
And then I have for you the options here. So first generation cephalosporins, for example, cephalexin, Bactrim, Augmentin, those are gonna be options that are safe in our pediatric population. And then patients that have an uncomplicated uh, urinary tract infection, so that's an otherwise healthy non-pregnant female, that's going to be nitrofurantoin, cephalexin, or Bactrim. And then complicated urinary tract treatment, that's going to be a treatment for seven days, so a little bit on the longer duration, and that's cephalexin, Bactrim, or fluoroquinolones. Options are going to be levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. Up here on the right-hand corner, I included for you pregnant urinary tract infection treatment. This is gonna be important for you to know on boards, and if you remember back to one of my first videos, there is the acronym CAMP SAFE in Pregnancy. So that's cephalexin, amoxicillin, or amoxicillin with clavulanate, metronidazole, or penicillins. All of those are gonna be safe in pregnancy, and the most appropriate one here, of course, again, is cephalexin. This is first-line treatment for the pregnant patients for their UTI treatment if they have no recent antibiotic exposure or history of resistance. Nitrofurantoin is another option for pregnant patients with UTIs, but there's some stipulations, so you really want to be cognizant of that. You want to avoid it in the first trimester unless there's absolutely no other alternative, and then absolutely avoid it in patients greater than 36 weeks. This is due to an increased risk of neonatal hemolytic anemia. So it's a really important key point there. There's some options for pain. There's antispasmodics, and that's for, like I said, dysuria or pain. Um, a great example of that is going to be peridium. And it's important to know that this drug does turn the urine orange, so we want to educate our patients not to be alarmed. And then, of course, there's also some education points like drinking lots of water. This actually helps to prevent recurrent urinary tract infections, so that's another important key point to educate on. Also, we can teach our patients to avoid after sexual intercourse um, and then avo avoid bladder irritants such as caffeine, alcohol, carbonated beverages, and then fruit juice as well. Urosepsis is a potentially fatal complication of an untreated urinary tract infection. The infection travels to the kidneys, of course leads to organ dysfunction, and then potentially organ failure. And our elderly patients are are at an increased risk of developing urosepsis, and they present with more unique signs, such as mental status changes, tachycardia, tachypnea, decreased urine output, and they're oftentimes also afebrile. So these are really important symptoms to look out for in our elderly patients when we suspect that a UTI might be going on. Pyelonephritis is an infection of the kidney and the upper urinary tract. So risk factors for pylo are going to be an untreated urinary tract infection, diabetes, elderly patients, patients with urinary tract abnormalities, patients with fecal incontinence, and then our pregnant patients as well are at an increased risk of pylo. So symptoms of pyelonephritis are going to be a rapid onset of dysuria, urgency, frequency, fever, chills, tachycardia, so the definitely more systemic symptoms, nausea, vomiting, flank pain, and then CVA tenderness. Also, urine may be positive for leukocyte esterases, nitrites, hematuria, and proteinuria, and then also bacteria and white blood cell casts. Outpatient is never going to be appropriate in male patients, patients with chronic renal disease, kidney, um, kidney stones present, any kind of anatomic urinary tract abnormalities, or if the patient is immunocompromised, then those patients need to be managed in the hospital. Also, if our patients are appearing critically ill or toxic, they're unable to keep fluids down, oral meds down, uncontrollable pain, or persistent high fever greater than 101. If our patient is a female, immunocompetent, not pregnant, generally otherwise healthy, then they may be able to be managed outpatient. And if that is the case, then go ahead and refer back to the urinary tract infection treatment slide and all of the meds there for the complicated UTI, because this is technically a complicated urinary tract infection as it is in the kidneys. So meds that are for the complicated urinary tract infection are going to be appropriate for this population as well. But of course, what's important here is to note who is not appropriate to be managed outpatient, and that's listed for you there. So there's a lot of things that can cause hematuria, but one thing that needs to definitely be on our radar and potentially in our differential is going to be bladder cancer. 
85% of bladder cancer actually presents with hematuria. And symptoms of bladder cancer include hematuria without stones, painless hematuria, history of smoking. Also, dysuria may be present, and it's not related, of course, to a urinary tract infection. In these circumstances where we're considering bladder cancer as a possibility, we want to go ahead and order a UA, a urine culture, and then urine cytology. In these patients, we absolutely want to be referring to urology. Of course, there are some other causes for hematuria, for example, infection, stones, TB, trauma, and then even exercise-induced hematuria. All right, so next up is kidney stones. There are a variation of different types of stones, calcium being the most common, 60 to 70% of kidney stones are actually made up of calcium. So symptoms of kidney stones are gonna be a colicky flank pain, and that pain is actually caused by obstruction. And when the patient is no longer feeling pain, then that means that the obstruction has resolved, but not necessarily that the stone has passed, that could still be present. Other symptoms of kidney stones are going to be hematuria, nausea, vomiting, dysuria, and generally they do not have a fever. If you've ever taken care of a patient with a kidney stone, then I feel like you just know what those specific patients look like. They oftentimes do tell you, I've even had pregnant, or I'm not sorry, not pregnant, but women that have given vaginal births say that kidney stones were more painful, and they're oftentimes so uncomfortable that they're pacing around. It's just a very identifiable patient. So diagnostic, the gold standard for diagnosing kidney stones is going to be a CT with non-contrast. And then treatment, so refer to ER if the pain is uncontrollable, if we suspect urosepsis, obviously, oliguria or anuria, so very infrequent urinating or not urinating at all, unable to keep fluids down, all of those are gonna be great indicators that they need to be managed within the hospital. If this patient is able to be managed outpatient, then NSAIDs, if they're not, of course, contraindicated within your patient, that can actually help to decrease the urethral smooth muscle tone and spasms, which helps the stone, of course, to pass. And then Tamsulosin or Flomax is another appropriate treatment for this patient as well. And then also we want to educate our patients to increase fluid intake and use a urine strainer to see if they can actually catch the stone and you can actually have it sent out for analysis. All right, so next up is urinary incontinence, and there's two types to focus on here, stress incontinence and urge incontinence. So stress incontinence is urinary incontinence that occurs with an increase in abdominal pressure. So for example, sneezing or engaging in physical exercise, and this is generally due to weakness in the pelvic floor. This often at times occurs in women 45 years and older, specifically those women that have had vaginal birth and then also women who have obesity as well. Treatment is gonna be weight loss if it's indicated, Kegel exercises, bladder training, and then educating to avoid alcohol, caffeine, and smoking. There is a pharmacological treatment option available and that's gonna be estrogen vaginal cream. Urge incontinence is urinary incontinence due to overactive and unstable detrusor muscle. Your urgency and frequency, they can experience this as often as every one to two hours. Treatment, again, is gonna be weight loss if it's indicated, bladder training, and then avoiding alcohol, caffeine, and smoking. And then a pharmacological treatment option for this is gonna be oxybutynin. Okay, so acute kidney injury, this is an abrupt and oftentimes reversible decline in the glomerular filtration rate, and it causes an increase in metabolic waste, for example, serum, blood, urea, nitrogen, and then, of course, a creatinine. So symptoms are going to be sudden oliguria, edema, and then weight gain. Also, they may experience lethargy, nausea, and anorexia as well. Typically, these symptoms will last 7 to 21 days. However, there are some patients that unfortunately go on to require dialysis for months thereafter. So there is some diagnostic criteria. I included it for you here. It reads, an increase in serum creatinine of 0.3 within 48 hours, or 50% greater within seven days, or a urine output less than 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour for greater than 60 hours. That's definitely more specific than any questions you'll see on your board's exam, but I just put it there for your reference because it's good to know. There are, of course, some very important labs to monitor with our patients who are having an acute kidney injury. So the serum creatinine, this is when the renal function decreases and this increases. 
and this also can be elevated or falsely elevated in patients with low muscle mass. So for example, our elderly patients. Creatinine clearance, this is a 24 hour urine and this evaluates for proteinuria, albuminuria, and then microalbuminuria. And it's a more sensitive test than the serum creatinine test. It gives you a relatively constant result and it's irregardless of the patient's fluid status. And then of course, the GFR or estimated glomerular filtration rate. And this measures the amount of fluid that's being filtered by the glomerulus within a certain amount of time. And it's used to evaluate for renal dysfunction or renal failure. And then I gave you the labs for the GFR, of course, like I said, in the AANP, all of the labs are provided to you, but that is not the case in AANC. So the normal GFR is gonna be greater than 60, abnormal is less than 60, and then chronic kidney disease is less than 60 for a minimum of three months. Which brings us to rhabdomyolysis, as an acute kidney injury is oftentimes a common complication of rhabdomyolysis. So rhabdomyolysis is a syndrome characterized by muscle necrosis or death, and then the release of that mus those muscle cells into circulation. So risk factors for rhabdomyolysis are going to be a crush injury, history of high dose statin use, history of frequent EDSED use, patients who participate in extreme exercise, and then a history of high fever. These are all going to be risk factors for rhabdo. Symptoms Patients are going to complain of myalgias, muscle, muscle weakness, fatigue, oliguria, and then tea-colored urine. Myalgia, muscle weakness, tea-colored urine, those are three really important things to look out for when determining if your patient might have rhabdomyolysis. So creatinine kinase, or CK, those level, levels are generally markedly increased. They're usually at least five times the upper limit of normal. And if we suspect rhabdomyolysis in our patients, then this is an emergent referral to the ER as a fasciotomy is the definitive treatment. And we're definitely not doing that outpatient. All right, so you know what this means. We have reached the end of the discussion. I told you this one was going to be relatively painless. Here is your dump sheet to help supplement your studying. It's completely dedicated to genital, urinary, and renal disease, and it should help you hone in on those key points that you need to know for your board's exam. As always, go ahead and leave me any comments or questions down below or connect with me on the new NP Facebook page. And then if you want to support this channel, I greatly appreciate it. Go ahead and like and subscribe and then share with anyone else that you think might benefit from these videos as well. All right guys, I wish you all the very best. Take care and I will talk to you soon.